I'm in Rollins, Wyoming right now. It's uh, typically in the teens at night, sometimes below in single digits, and just below freezing during the daytime. So I've been using a lot of my different heat sources and concerning myself with trying to patch up my freeze protection system, which I never finished. I, I'm, I'm here for a funeral and I uh, didn't have time to get it all done. So this is some little, some little details in here about how the system works. And, and how um, I'm using it. We're gonna be here for a couple of weeks and the weather has turned nasty. The aftermath of driving in freezing weather. Oh. Oh. And, and, Wait, wait. Look for it, look for it. We have road art. nights ago it got down to about 10 degrees uh, right now at this moment it's still below freezing it's been below freezing for the last couple of days we've been here and so it's an opportunity for us to exercise and test our freeze protection system because we really haven't well first off I haven't completely finished it and I've been doing some some expedient repairs over the last couple of days and some some finishing some of it let's uh, cover for a few minutes uh, what the plan is for freeze protection so the freeze protection plan for the two water tanks in the back seat of the truck is that each of the two tanks has a heat strip underneath of it and a thermal controller indoors. These are the two water tanks in the back of the truck. The, the pipes connect so the 25 gallon water supply comes across here to the pump. But we also have return lines to each tank here and here. So I use the return lines to put hot water into the, into the fresh water tanks to keep them from freezing. All the while there's an electric heater underneath of them if necessary. Um, um, all of these lines need to be protected from freezing. The cab itself does a pretty decent job of providing some layer of insulation, but as you can see each of these lines is a half inch PEX is covered with a half inch of polyethylene foam and a, and a piece of heat tape underneath of it. All the heat tapes terminate down here and then go through the wall and even the passage through the wall has a heat tape on it to make sure that the small pipes that go through the wall aren't uh, getting too cold. The lines that flow between the tanks into the cabin are insulated and I yesterday I just installed a heat strip on them but the heat strips not currently hooked up so the insulation alone is hopefully sufficient and what we've seen over the last couple of days is that the double layer of the cab providing some uh, insulation and the insulated tanks themselves does very well to keep the tanks above freezing all by themselves but the temperature, the heaters have been coming on periodically. Underneath of the 18 gallon tank is my pump compartment. My pump compartment has a... This is a cartridge heater for a 3D printer. This uh, is a 12 volt, 40 watt heater and this does get very hot. I'm using these in these. These are my own versions of a homemade heater. But what I've done is I've drilled a hole in the, each end of this heat sink in the thick section of aluminum and placed one of these cartridge heaters in there. So the cartridge heater now applies heat into here and it will be spread through the heat sink using the CPU fan. Um, this is a similar device. This has got a big copper plug down the center of it. So again, there's two um, of these heaters in it and this fan. This is what I have in my wet bay. I have an insulated box with three quarters of an inch of polyisocyanurate foam in it. The pump, the accumulator, and the valve block is, are all mounted on a board and this board can be removed by, if I uh, remove my quick disconnects from this. But also inside of here, if you look right between here, you can see the aluminum fins of one of those CPU heatsink heaters. That heater monitors the uh, so I monitor the temperature of this inside the cabin I can tell what temperature the pump is running at and the the fan will come on if I if I turn the freeze protection system on 
the fan comes on on this and it runs and it circulates air in here continually. And normally speaking, the water pump alone produces enough heat in order to keep the pump, the compartment warm. Uh, but if it doesn't, that the heater will come on and circulate air heat inside this compartment. I only have uh, one single 40 watt heater in here when it's more than adequate to keep it warm. The other portion of the freeze protection system for the water tanks is that I have a circulation system and so I can make hot water flow from the hot water heater into the fresh water tanks in order to raise their temperature. That's intended to be the primary means elevating the temperature in the tanks. The, the electric mean is the backup means. What does here is down on this monitoring panel here, um, what I'm most interested in this moment is the temperature of my water hot fresh water tank in the in the 18 gallon tank and the temperature in the 25 gallon tank both of them are you know in the single digit celsius normally what i do i have electric heaters under these things which will come on this this light above it here will come on and the electric heater will come on at one degree and shot off at, at three degrees or four degrees i really don't like to rely on using my electricity for heating i like to use my diesel heater diesel coolant heater to do that and so what i do is i run the diesel coolant heater i set it to coolant heat water. I turn the coolant heater on. It heats the water tank up and now you can see my water tank temperature now is 55 centigrade which is 150 degrees Fahrenheit or so. And what I do is because I have a water return system that I can allow hot water to flow back into my cool cold water tanks. We use a shower diverter which is what this knob is right here. The shower diverter allows us to purge the cooled water out of the hot water lines back to the fresh tank without losing it, without having to endure a cold shower. This uh, diverter has another function in the cold weather. By moving it up to the vertical position here, it starts the hot water flowing all the way up through the hot water lines to here. But if you leave it on, it will dump the hot water into the fresh water tank, which is how we keep our fresh water tanks warmer during the winter. This is a manual process and I'm gonna automate this. Okay, I'm working in the wet, I'm working the wet bay here. One of the things that I've just finished is to add this motorized ball valve here, which allows me to take hot water and dump it into the tank fill so I can uh, be part of my automated freeze protection. This is called an asymmetric timing relay. This relay is going to operate the valve which dumps hot water into the cold water tanks in order to keep them warm in the winter. So what we have is on the top here, we have a counters, we have identical counters. This is the on-time counter. This is the on-time counter. The on-time counter is set to one minute at 50%, which means this will be on for 30 seconds. The off-time counter is set to one hour at 50%, which means it's gonna be off for 30 minutes. So on for 30 seconds, off for 30 minutes. And then what this will do is it will open the ball valve for 30 seconds every 30 minutes and dump warm water or hot water, depending on how hot the water in the water tank is, into the fresh tank to keep it from freezing. Sources, our water heater is underneath of the cab of the truck, which exposes it to lots of air movement and causes it to get cooled much more rapidly. And I think the biggest problem with that is that the cooling of the lines which flow from the water heater to the to the wet bay is what's really in question. Uh, we did have those freeze up yesterday. I didn't have them insulated. And so they're now insulated and they're also bundled with the coolant lines from the coolant heater. So it's really intended that the coolant heater, when operating to heat hot water, will uh, pump 180 degree water in and around the two water lines going to and from the uh, calorifier and that will take care of it. And I'm quite sure that that's what will happen. Internally, uh, everything is inside of the cabin uh, other than the, the supply tank and the hot water tank. So the outflow that we have goes to the gray tank. And so the gray tank lines are now insulated. The other thing that happened yesterday, you are under in the wheel well on the driver's side. You will see the yellow tape there. I have uh, added some insulation to the, this is where the, the drain line comes through the floor and goes to the gray tank. I added some insulation, but I also put a heat tape inside of the pipe that I can heat up that line. Okay, you're looking directly from the rear forward on top of the gray tank and you can see three entrance into the gray tank and you can see that there's a heat tape running around the center one so it runs from the cabin to the gray tank around it and then back to the shower line which is on the right hand side 
That heat tape should keep it fairly warm. The gray tank, unfortunately, has no heating to it or temperature sensing on it either way. So one of the things that I had to do uh, just a couple days ago, knowing that we were coming into freezing weather, was I, I bought a small automotive light bulb and I put I placed it right next to the macerator pump and I and insulated it heavily with uh, solid sheets of po extruded polystyrene. One of our last freeze protection projects. Yeah, I should have done this at home. Didn't yeah. do it at home, so guess where we're doing at? Oh, uh, there's an orange shopping cart. And taped it all on there to try to keep the macerator pump from freezing. The plan for keeping the gray tank from freezing is to run coolant lines from the coolant heater to the underside of the tank and make some loops on the underside of the tank to heat it and also to have electric backup for the uh, gray tank. So neither one of those have been implemented yet. The way that we managed it yesterday is to dump a bunch of hot water down the drain and make sure we put some heat into the gray tank that way. We are in Rollins, Wyoming. It is very cold here. It has been in the teens at night and then the twenties during the daytime. Um, been using our coolant heater a lot. So after we've talked about the freeze protection system and now that we've uh, had an opportunity to exercise our hydronic heating system, it might be worthwhile to take a moment to refresh your memory on what it is. Uh, what we have here, the heating part of the, the cabin heat system has got two fan coils. So this is one of two indoor fan coils. This is running right now. It's got two high capacity 120 millimeter fans behind it. It blows out a good deal of hot air and it's almost silent. And one in the bunk area. This is the other fan coil that's in the cabin. This one is in the bunk. It's in the driver's or passenger side. Um, it's got a lever valve on top there. You can restrict the flow somewhat if you're getting too much heat, which does happen. This thing heats up the bunk uh, pretty toasty. Um, it's very, very quiet. It's almost almost silent when you're sleeping. You don't notice it. And then the, we have a towel radiator, which is actually really a clothes dryer in, in the uh, shower area. If it's in the teens outside, the coolant heater ha struggles not to overheat the cabin. It's, it's a lot of heat. Five kilowatts of uh, coolant heat is quite a bit. With all this uh, coolant piping flowing everywhere, it's necessary to have a place where we can fill it and also a place where we can uh, manage the air to be let out of the system and that's what this is. is. This is an expansion tank. This tank is sitting as high up in the control column as I can get it. This is where we add all the coolant to the system and also where any bubbles that are in the system can work their way out. There's also auto vents on the towel heater and on the bunk heater because those two are actually the highest, they're actually this, these three items are all about the same height so that's where any air will, will escape to. As I just turned the coolant heater on, so I got two temperature uh, monitors here. This doesn't control anything. This shows that the hot coolant coming out of the, the coolant heater, and this shows the cooled coolant going in. So you can see that's a difference of about six and a half or seven degrees at the moment. But you can see this is heating rapidly. One of the key features of the uh, hydronic system is actually being able to use the engine to heat hot water. So one of the things that the switch can do is uh, if I set it to engine heat water, it changes the fluid circuitry so that the engine will pipe hot coolant through the, the 20 liter Shurcal chlorifier and heat up a tank of water. And this happens uh, pretty quickly. Uh, I've also got a system here where it monitors the temperature of it and it cuts off the tank when it gets hot. This might be interesting. Uh, cabin heat's been running for a while. The, the controller says it's outputting 75C water. The terminal gauge here says 74C. Again, these always, this is always a little bit cooler. It's a little farther away from the pump. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, the, I've kept the door of the camper open so that it doesn't get overheated in here. But I'm going to go ahead and heat some more water. My water, I just dumped a bunch more into the fresh tanks. This is down to 22 degrees just to kind of give you some idea what happens. And you want to watch these two things here as, as soon as I switch the coolant loop. So this, this selector lever here operates motorized ball valves which changes the flow pattern of the coolant loop. So if I move it to coolant heat water, it'll, it'll stop sending water to the cabin and it'll start sending water to the water heater. And you can see the water heater, water inside the water heater is about 21 degrees, which means the coolant in the water heater is about 21 degrees too. So you can see this hydronic temperature here now just plummets. The water, the hot coolant that was in the loop is now being pulling the cold water, the cold coolant that was in the water heater through it. And so this temperatures are, are, are dropping. It's already dropped 10 degrees in, you know, in 10 seconds. 
So you can see the coolant heater went from 74, it's now at 58 output, 57. It's still dropping too because all this coolant in the loop that was not active is, is cooled off. And so now it's going to, it's going to bottom out and then it's going to start heating again. It's already slowing down. We're getting a 61, 60.9, 0.8, 0.7. So in, in a little bit here, another couple minutes, it'll bottom out and start heating again. And you'll see that the, the water temperature in the t water tank is already rising. This was at 20 point something, now it's 21.3, 21.4, 21.5. So the water in the water tank is being heated. This only takes about 10 minutes to heat a tank of water from, let's call it 50 degrees Fahrenheit up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. It'll raise it to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit in about 10 minutes. So it doesn't take long at all. And the, the great advantage of the system is, is that as you're driving, when this lever is set to engine heat water, the engine coolant will, will course through the calorifier and heat a tank of hot water. And that heats it up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit or 80 degrees centigrade. And this control right here, because the engine heat oftentimes gets much hotter than I want hot water tanks is as soon as this temperature reaches 80 centigrade in the hot water tank, it shuts off the coolant loop to the engine. So it prevents the engine from overheating the water tank, which if you have an uncontrolled system will happen and you can actually be a very dangerous situation. If you have water in your water tank in, ex in excess of 100 centigrade or 212 Fahrenheit, as soon as you open the tap, you'll have a blast of boiling water flashing to steam. Uh, which is exceedingly dangerous. One of the big problems that I had with my hydronic system since the start was I had tiny little leaks that kept occurring, never could figure out where they were. I went through, and it was all in the wet bay. It was down here in the wet bay. So I changed clamps, I tightened clamps, I, I chased, I chased, I chased. The coolant heater is running, the coolant pump is running. What I've been doing over the last couple of days is to try to find my leak. It couldn't find the leak, but thought I had solved it. Problem connection, I think. I only got one connection left in here, so let's try to zero in on it here. It's all the way at the back here. My problem is I know it's leaking, you know, underneath the front part of it here. Okay, well, I'm sorry about the propane burner running in the background. It's 20 degrees outside. Um, so right here is my problem, this elbow. Also still a little evidence of some coolant leaking out around that connector so it could have a bad uh, shark bite connector but i've also noticed that this fitting right here if i wiggle it i can see little signs of coolant and i don't know whether that's actively leaking or not but uh, i'm gonna probably pull this out and cut the hose off system for an entire hour had no leaks in it took it home uh, went out and observed it every half hour to an hour, didn't see any leaks. And then when I, when I went about an hour and a half for check and came back and there was a big puddle there. So it wasn't close to where the leak was, it was kind of spread all over. And that's my problem is I can't see exactly where the leak is. Spent about, oh, 10 hours, 15 hours chasing a leak. I could never find the leak and I'm going to explain it to you because it's, it's actually pretty profound. What you'll see here is a shark bite fitting here and a shark bite fitting here. Now these are both ball valves and these are closed, but the return side of it had the same fitting on here and the fitting uh, had a loop of plastic going from one to the other. And what I discovered was that the loop caused stress on the O-ring seal inside of this shark bite fitting. Now the leak didn't, wouldn't leak when it was in operation because the pressure of the fluid forced the O-ring to seal. The problem became when the pressure was released after the system cooled down and there was no longer pressure, pressure to cause the O-ring to seal that it would leak. And so that's one of the phenomena of won't leak under pressure, will leak when there's no pressure. And that's because of the phenomena of how O-rings seal. I'm taking advantage of the fact that my brother built this shop that uh, used to run as an auto mechanic shop. and. He became disabled and now has recently died and left it to me. So it's a great opportunity to put my camper up and raise the work where I can see it. Thanks, Mike.